Good morning. God's blessings to you today. Today we begin a new series of messages, and, and I'll, I'll just say I am really looking forward to these and very excited about them. I believe they are especially appropriate for the day and age in which we find ourselves and for the time in human history where we find ourselves. We're going to be talking about the armor of God, and specifically we're going to be looking at what the Apostle Paul had to say to the Ephesians. I, I think it very significant that Paul spoke at great length about putting on the full armor of God as he wrote to, to believers in Ephesus in the Roman province of Asia. It was there that the Apostle Paul had encountered incredible opposition, went through times of great difficulty, and he learned he learned from experience as well as from the clear teachings of Scripture the importance of being suited up with the armor of God. And so today we're going to start studying that armor of God. We're going to look at some of the opening words of the Apostle Paul as they're recorded in Ephesians chapter 6 beginning at verse 10 as he reminds us of the importance of being fully equipped for battle. Before we go any further, let's start with a word of prayer. Let's ask the Holy Spirit's guidance, direction, enlightenment, and, and outpouring upon us so that we may be fully equipped to do all that God is calling us to do through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We join together. Heavenly Father, we bless your name. We honor you because you are our God, and we give you praise and adoration. We thank you that you speak truth always you speak truth. You, you tell us both what you have done and you provide us with all that we need. May we receive your word of truth this day. May your Holy Spirit come upon us in power that we may internalize the truths of Scripture and apply them directly to our daily life of service to Jesus. We thank you that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. And we pray that we may come to not only a deeper appreciation of your gifts in Christ, but that we may also use those gifts. May they not sit on the shelf in our lives. May they instead be part of our daily practice and living. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior, who has risen from the grave and who is soon to return. To him be praise today and always. Amen. Well, we are going to start looking at Paul's description of the armor of God, but it's more than a description. It is also an encouragement to make use of that armor in our daily life. Uh, there are several things that I believe we need to think on first off, and that is that we are called to put on the armor of God certainly implies that the Christian life is no cakewalk. Now, please do not mistake what I'm saying here. Knowing Jesus as Savior Repenting and receiving him as Savior and Lord brings incredible joy. Knowing that God is in control of my life, that the, the Holy Spirit is poured out through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, understanding that God is near, those things bring remarkable joy and purpose to living. But at the same time, the scripture is also very clear that the Christian life is a battle. And it is a battle because we are not doing this on our own. God is the one who equips, the one who blesses, the one who guides. But we also have an enemy. And here again, the scriptures are very clear that our enemy and adversary is the devil. And that he has a host of demonic beings who are at work against the purposes of God. I recognize that is not always a popular teaching in our day and age. We are living in a, a day where many individuals simply poo-poo the notion of spiritual warfare or of a devil, a personal devil, or demonic, demonic beings. And yet, the scriptures are clear on this. And I might add, throughout hu history, human beings have been very clear about it. Although in our age, it's considered enlightened to say that, well, you know, th that's the, the way people used to think. The fact is that every culture that has left written records has recognized the nature of demonic forces, spiritual forces that seek to undermine, destroy, kill, steal, and plunder. That is the teaching of the Bible as well, and it is the teaching of Jesus. He made it very clear that he was going to do battle against the forces of darkness, against the devil himself. 
And he reminds us of the importance of trusting him in the midst of that battle as well. Our Christian life is a joyous one, but it is also a war. And in warfare, it is absolutely essential that we have every weapon that God makes available to face up to the adversary. And so it's on that note that we take a look at what the Apostle Paul says. We're going to focus in today on Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. We're not going to rush through this. We're going to take our time in these coming weeks to really study and reflect on the word, to mine the scriptures so that we have deeper understanding, but more than that, so that we are able to put into practice the very things the Bible teaches. Here is what the Apostle Paul says, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, the book of Ephesians is a very fascinating letter. Throughout the centuries, people have observed that the first half of this letter seems to focus on doctrinal issues, the foundational truths of the Christian faith. The, the first three chapters of Ephesians talks about how we have been lifted up into the heavenly places with Christ, that we have been adopted into his family, into the family of God, and that God has done remarkable things to deliver us. It is by grace that we have been saved through faith as Ephesians 2 tells us. These are precious truths. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, on the other hand, talk about living the Christian life. And, and there are glorious truths that are expressed there as we are told to praise God, as we're told to practice our faith in our families, in our marriages, in our, our workplaces. But now as we come to the end of the final chapter of Ephesians, you can almost make an argument that this is a totally separate section. After talking about the fundamental doctrinal truths of the faith, and after talking about the joy of living that faith, the Apostle Paul ends with a warning and an encouragement. He reminds us, don't forget, this is a war. And so he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Those are profound words. And I believe they need to be carefully evaluated and reflected upon. And so what we're going to do right now is take a look at each phrase and reflect on what that means for us. Finally, Paul says, be strong in the Lord. You know, we human beings admire strength. We are taught to participate in strength training so that we maintain our muscle mass as we get older. That, quite honestly, has been on my mind over these last months as we uh, prepared to move to Michigan. I, I found myself moving an awful lot of heavy stuff, including boxes of books. And when I picked those things up, I thought to myself, you know, these are heavier than they used to be. <laughs> we know as time goes by, we lose muscle mass. We admire strength. But what God tells us is this, be strong in the Lord. You see, it is one thing to have physical strength, but you can be as strong as the proverbial ox and if you are not strong in the Lord, you are a spiritual weakling. And so the Apostle Paul, who often speaks in terms of athletics and in terms of warfare, reminds us as we live the Christian life, be sure that you are strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. That is something the Bible speaks of frequently. Old and New Testament alike, Hebrew scriptures and Greek scriptures remind us of the importance of being strong in the Lord. The Lord is my strength and my shield, the psalmist writes. I, I think of an incident from the life of David when he was threat threatened with death and, and was at a point that he was ready to despair. But he found his strength in the Lord. In fact, if you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30, uh, right around verse 6, and that's where we're going to head here this morning. 
This is a story of David at, at a time in his life when he had been on the run. You'll recall David had uh, become Israel's hero when he slew, <laughs> killed Goliath, let's get it right, when he killed Goliath with a, a sling and a stone. But with his heroism and with his popularity came a great deal of trial as well. King Saul became intensely jealous of David. We are told in the book of 1 Samuel that while David was filled with the Spirit of God, an evil spirit came upon Saul. And at one point in David's life, not long before the death of Saul, David faced a, faced a test that tried him in a way beyond much of what he had experienced prior to that. Even his own friends were turning on him. And that's what we read about in 1 Samuel chapter 30. David had set up a camp with 600 of his, his fellow warriors at a place called Ziklag. And while David and his men were gone, the Amalekites, historic enemies of the people of God, raided the camp at Ziklag took everything, including wives and children of these 600 warriors. David's wives were also taken. And uh, we read this in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. At this time, when it appeared that all was lost, when David and others were grieving, and when even his own friends had not only turned on him, but were talking about killing him, what does David do? He finds his strength in the Lord his God. Now, David was a strong warrior. Even later in his life, as he got into his 50s and 60s, David was still admired as a man of incredible strength. But David understood something profound, and that is you can be strong physically, but you need the Lord's strength to face the trials of life. And in one of the greatest trials he had experienced in his young life, he was somewhere around 30 at this point. David found his strength in the Lord. It may well be that you are going through a time of great trial in your life today. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that we are going to go through the Christian life without trials, difficulties, struggles, and loss. In fact, one of the things that I have seen over the years in talking to new believers is that very often when a person first comes to faith in the living God, they say, this is wonderful. Everything is going so well. But you talk to them a little later and they say, oh my, there has been so much pushback. I can't believe what's going on. And what they are being introduced to is the whole principle of spiritual warfare. The devil is not happy when people turn to God. The enemy is not pleased when believers resolve to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The enemy does not like it when God's people commit themselves to doing God's work. And so pushback comes. That's what David experienced. And he found his strength in the Lord, his God. You and I are no different. We need to be strong in the Lord. We need to find our strength in him. But Paul does not end there. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Because what the scriptures teach is that God is all powerful. And even though the enemy can mess up our lives and impose himself upon us and make life incredibly difficult, even though he can attack in a variety of ways, the fact is God is more powerful than the devil. And while the devil is a murderer from the beginning, as Jesus taught, he desires to rob and kill and destroy. God is good and God watches over his people and he offers his people his divine strength, but more than that, his mighty power. When I think of the mighty power of God, there's so many things from the scriptures that come to mind, but one that especially comes to mind, because it really is spiritual warfare, is the example of Aaron 
in the court of Pharaoh at the time of Moses. It's recorded in the book of Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 7, where we read these words. Uh, just to, to give you background to the story, some weeks before this, Aaron's brother Moses, his younger brother, had encountered the living God at a place known as Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Moses had seen a, a bush that was on fire but was not consumed by the flames. And suddenly Moses heard a voice. The ground on which you are standing is holy ground. Moses, take off your sandals. And God revealed himself to Moses. God also called Moses at the age of 80. After 40 years in the wilderness, God called Moses to lead his children out of bondage in Egypt. And he gave Moses the tools that he needed to carry out that incredibly difficult work. God told Moses to throw down his staff and the staff became a serpent. And then God invited Moses to touch the tail of the serpent and it became a staff once again. Those are not fairy stories. This is real. And it is that staff that Moses' brother Aaron would hold many weeks later as he and Moses confronted the most powerful man in the world at that time, the Pharaoh of Egypt. This is what we read in the book of Exodus chapter 7 about the encounter between Aaron and some of the religious leaders of Egypt. We read these words, Exodus 7, beginning at verse 10. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. There are spiritual powers that are unseen by the human eye, but they are real. And here we have a case of warfare, spiritual warfare, on a scale that was unprecedented. As Aaron demonstrates the power of God by throwing down the staff, it becomes a serpent. But then Pharaoh commands his sorcerers to throw down their staffs, and by magical arts, they're able to do the same thing. And you'd say, well, you know, whoa, that's a standoff, isn't it? No, it's not. Read what follows. <laughs> Verse 12, each one threw down his staff and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. In other words, God won. God's power trumps the power of the devil. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that that power is ours. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that is at work in us. Jesus told his disciples, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God gives power to his people, and he calls us, you and me, it is no different in the 21st century than it was in the first century. God has not changed. His word has not changed. He gives power to his people. And so he tells us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, to rely not upon ourselves, but to rely upon God, to live by faith, to act boldly, carrying out the work Jesus has given us to do, and to rely upon his mighty power. It is at that point that the Apostle Paul goes one step further. He says, put on the full armor of God. In other words, take up everything that God offers you. Because if we go into this battle in our own strength, we're going to fail. But in God's strength, he will accomplish everything he has promised. I'd like to share a story with you that illustrates that. It's a story that took place about 40 years ago. I, I remember it well because I was part of the story. At, at that time, I was a brand new graduate out of the seminary. I'd been called back to the church where I had done my internship and had been called in a very large congregation to be the evangelism pastor. I, I was fresh out of seminary, 
young guy in his mid-twenties, uh, had a lot of book learning, but not a whole lot of experience. And I still remember a phone call that shook me greatly. I was in my office. All the other pastors were out on calls or busy with other things. And so this call came to me, the new guy. The senior pastor was busy with something else. The assistant pastor was busy with something else. The retired pastor was engaged in something else. And I was in my office and I got the phone call and it was only right. I was the evangelism pastor. And this was someone who needed evangelizing. The phone call went like this. We have a baby. All of a sudden, we sense another presence in the house. The baby's room gets icy cold, even though the heat is on and every other room in the house is warm. I can sense this other presence. I can hear footsteps going down into our basement, even though I can't see anyone. And that presence gets close to me and I keep talking to it and telling it to leave me alone, but it won't. Can you help us? I had read about these things in the Bible, but in all honesty, I hadn't been taught about them. In fact, just recently, I, I pulled out the textbook that I, I used at the seminary for pastoral theology. It doesn't have anything in it about demonic beings and exorcisms, doesn't have anything in it about spiritual powers other than the power of God, because we basically live in a culture where that has often been ignored, especially in more recent times. And as I'm listening to this person on the phone, she tells me the rest of the story. She said, I, I asked the question, I believe something like, well, how did you happen to call here? And her response was this, her husband had gone to Sunday school a couple of times when he was a little boy with a friend of his who went to the church that I was now serving. And so as the two of them were trying to figure out what to do, her husband, who was not a believer, neither was she, had said, why don't we call that church? I went there when I was in Sunday school. Maybe they can help. And at that point, I said, I, I'll be happy to come by and talk to you guys. She was thrilled. And they said, come over right away. They were thrilled. I'll be honest, I was scared to death. I, I, I just remember talking to God saying, Lord, they did not teach me how to deal with this. You got to help me here. I had no clue other than what I had read in the scriptures. And so I showed up at their house and they began describing all that had gone on. It was chilling. It, it sounded like something out of a horror movie. But it appeared to be genuine, and, and they were very forthright about it, and obviously very scared. As we talked, I, I began asking a couple of questions. One of the questions I asked is, who lived in the house before you? What I learned is, the house had formerly been owned by some drug dealers. That did not really surprise me, because I know both from the scriptures as well as from human experience, that being involved in a, a drug lifestyle, a drug-fueled lifestyle, invites demonic attack. We then talked about what was going on in their home. And uh, as the wife described the way she had been talking to this being, I, I asked her a question, do you realize that that's prayer? And, and she was a little bit shocked. I said, prayer is talking to a power greater than ourselves. We're told to pray to God and to him alone. And, and she said, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. What, what ended up happening is this. I talked to the two of them about their need for the Lord Jesus Christ, their, their need and the need of their baby for what only God can do and the power that only he can provide. The end result is that we prayed over their home. They committed their lives to Jesus. They were baptized and uh, began attending classes. But something else happened. The noises stopped. The baby's room no longer got icy cold. And the wife said she no longer sensed that being in their home. You see, 
we're called to put on the full armor of God as we take our stand against the enemy, against the adversary, against the devil. I can assure you that I did not go there with great personal experience and with great personal bravery. I was scared to death. But God is powerful. And he tells us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, to put on the full armor of God. And the full armor of God includes speaking and living the very truths of Jesus and the truths of Scripture. And that is powerful. Well, the Apostle Paul goes on to say, do this, why? So that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. Our adversary, the devil, is an evil enemy. We are living in a world where some people are questioning the existence of evil, but you can't look at what is happening on this planet without realizing there is evil in the world. And the scripture makes it very clear that that evil is encouraged and abetted by the devil who has been an adversary of God throughout human history. He is described as that ancient serpent, the devil, the one who deceived our first parents and the one who continues, as Jesus says, to be a murderer and a liar. He is a deceiver. And in these last days, Jesus warned us that one of the greatest dangers is the danger of deception. Therefore, we need to be strong in the Lord strong in his mighty power. We need the full armor that God provides so that we may take our stand against the devil's schemes. The word that Paul uses here for taking one's stand is a word that can refer to standing boldly in a battle line, being unmoved. We may be frightened by what we see, but God is greater than our fears. And just as I encountered for the first time in my life as a pastor, demonic spirits 40 years ago, my only courage was found in the Lord himself. Not in me, not in my experience, but in what he says and what he offers. And we are told to take our stand against the devil's schemes. Since that time, I've learned a lot more about spiritual warfare. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come. But we're reminded that when we put on the armor of God, God works and he is able to accomplish everything that he intends in your life and in mine. In fact, one of my favorite passages in that regard is something that Jesus once spoke to a former enemy, a persecutor of followers of Jesus, who had become one of the greatest missionaries the world has ever known, a guy that we know as the Apostle Paul. When Jesus called the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, he said a number of things to Paul. One of the things he said is this, Acts chapter 26, verses 17 and 18. Jesus speaks to the Apostle and says, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. It is by God's power. It is by being strong in him. It is in using the armor of God that you and I can not only take our stand against the devil's schemes, but witness as God himself leads people from bondage to the power of the devil to life in the living God. That, that is exciting. And that is our calling. And that is one of the reasons why the armor of God is so critical. It is not simply about protecting ourselves in the midst of spiritual warfare. It is about having all the tools we need to carry out the plan and purpose of God for our lives and to see others led to a knowledge of Jesus the Savior. That is his plan, and that is something that can only be accomplished in his strength 
and in His power, with His weaponry, that alone can stand against the devil's schemes. And that, my dear friends, is critical and important and essential. Amen? Amen. Let's speak a word to the Lord our God, shall we? Father, we come before you with humility because we bring nothing to the table. You are the one who created us. You are the one who redeemed us by the blood of your son. You are the one who empowered us by the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon our lives. We come before you believing your word. And this day, as we come into your holy presence, we say, Lord, equip us with all that we need for carrying out the Christian life, the warfare, the battle of being a follower of Jesus. May we daily put on the full armor of God. May we grow in our understanding of what that means. May we also increase in our practice of doing the Christian walk in your power and your strength. We pray it in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Look forward to continuing to reflect on the armor of God in these coming weeks. But today I would invite you just to take a little time to talk about these things. I, I'm sure this has generated some thoughts in your own mind and perhaps some questions or some memories or, or some desire to grow in the scripture. But here are a couple of things that you might want to talk about with one another. Uh, first of all, very personal. How has God manifested his power in your life during times of personal weakness? What are some of the stories from your life where you have seen the power of God deliver you from, from things that, that seemed overwhelming at the time? And, and then secondly, when have you experienced battle with the devil? Uh, one thing that helps us to grow in our Christian walk is to talk about the way God has manifested himself in our lives and the way he has given us strength and power to face life's difficulties, trials, losses, but also the direct attacks of the enemy. These are things that are worth discussing because they encourage us and they give encouragement to one another. I would encourage you to talk about such things now. God bless you, dear friends. See you next Sunday, and uh, the Lord be with you.